Do you have enemies? I know I find the best solution for that is, uh, is love. This episode comes with a pretty strong dose of do not try this at home, as in don't even touch this plant if you can help it. And in fact, if you see umbrella-shaped clusters of flowers like this, unless you're sure what it is, just avoid it in general. There's a few other plants around here with flower clusters similar to this, and if you see something like this, a few exceptions, but pretty good chance it's in the carrot family. And if that sounds safe, well it could be, but it could also kill you, or make you itch when exposed to sunlight. See, the carrot family is one of the less diverse families in terms of just how the plants look, but on the flip side, quite diverse in terms of the number of different smell and flavor chemicals that its plants produce. As a result, throughout human history, it's been one of the most useful plant families in terms of food production. As the name carrot family would suggest, carrots are in this family, and you can see a similar umbel of flowers, it's called, if you leave them over winter in the dirt, and then in the second year is when they produce their seeds. So usually you don't see that if you harvest them in their first year. And just a side note there, it actually appears that carrots were first grown for their seeds and not for their roots, but that's kind of a story for another day. But there's a lot of other useful plants in this family too, whether you're using the roots, flowers, leaves, or seeds. Lots of common garden vegetables and spices like uh, parsnip, parsley, fennel, celery, dill, cilantro, anise, cumin, lovage, angelica, caraway, some more exotic ones, ajwain, kalonji, pig nuts, asafoetida, chervils, calanthro, aracacha, skirret, silphium, and then a whole host of wild ones, ones that were never domesticated, used by people all around the world. So if you're in the wild and know what you're looking at, these plants can be a fantastic source of food. The trouble is, a lot of these plants to the inexperienced eye can be difficult to tell apart. And not only does the family contain some fantastic food sources, but it also contains some of the most deadly plants known to mankind. And this is one of them here, water hemlock, one of the most deadly plants in the northern hemisphere and probably the most violently toxic plant in North America. So these are a pretty common plant throughout a lot of the northern hemisphere, so it's a good one to know if you spend time outdoors. As you can guess from the name, water hemlock, they tend to grow near water, so that includes like stream banks, lake sides, uh, ditches. Here it's just growing in a ravine kind of between pastures, and they can grow even into some shallow water as well. And there's two main giveaways here that we're looking at a water hemlock. First, there's that distinctive umbrella or actually umbrellas within a bigger umbrella of flowers and then later seeds. But the leaves are here are distinctive too. First, the leaves are doubly compound, which means for each part that branches off the main stem, it'll branch a second time before you see individual leaflets. That's noteworthy within the family. Second, and this is the dead giveaway here that this is water hemlock, in each leaflet, the veins run from the center to the notches between the teeth in the side of the leaf. As far as I've read, water hemlock is the only carrot family plant with that feature. So which part of this plant should you avoid? Well, all of it, unfortunately. It's a pretty hefty plant, can grow up to two and a half meters tall. The worst part is the roots, but there have been poisonings from all parts of the plant. People using the hollow stems as straws or pea shooters. And there was one case where four or five people got together and rubbed themselves with it and got poisoned. I feel like there's a story there somewhere, but I don't know what it is. But the moral of the story is, yeah, don't do that. Why would you do that? In the root, if you cut it open, you can see it has chambers in it with this liquid, which kind of changes color when you expose it to air. And the poison is a lot stronger in this part. A piece here the size of a marble could kill you in under an hour. And a cow taking a good chomp on a plant like this, it could die within 15 minutes as well. So. It's a potent toxin. You may have heard that Socrates and several other ancient Greek prisoners were executed by having them drink hemlock. Now, there's some debate, but judging by the records of the effects it had on these prisoners as they died, that was probably poison hemlock, a different species, and not water hemlock. The two are related and both deadly, but this one is overall much worse in terms of the effects it has. The poison in water hemlock here is called cicutoxin, and it acts as a convulsant on the central nervous system, causing a lot of cell overactivity. A lot of poisonous plants are kind of straightforward in how they poison you. You know, this one maybe stops your breathing, this one maybe stops your heart, and they'll have some related side effects to that effect there. But this one, it reads a lot more like the fine print on a drug commercial. 
So if by misfortune you've ingested some water hemlock, within 15 to 60 minutes you can expect to start feeling some of the following symptoms. Tingling, prickling, and numb skin, dilated pupils, drowsiness, confusion, weakness, dizziness, tremors, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, uncontrollable bowel movements, and then the seizures start. Once those have started, now you can expect to experience raised body temperature, alternating slow and fast heart rhythm, high and low blood pressure, abnormal heart rhythm, blood acidification, swelling of the brain, internal blood clots, muscle breakdown, kidney failure, hallucinations, delirium, coma, excessive salivation, wheezing, and not breathing. As you can imagine, that not breathing at the end is one of the things that, it's often the cause of death. That or heart fibrillations, if not the effects of the seizuring itself. Now, the toxic dose here is pretty close to the lethal dose, meaning it's a pretty small window where a person could get poisoned but not killed by this. But if you do manage to fall within that window and survive all that and get treated immediately, you can expect to regain consciousness and stop seizuring after 24 to 48 hours, sometimes as much as 96 hours. And there's a chance you'll suffer amnesia too and forget this whole experience and what led up to it and also a chance that you'll experience ongoing restlessness, muscle weakness, twitching, and just general anxiety for days to months afterwards as you recover. So to re-summarize my earlier position, yeah, don't eat this. Now don't be fooled into thinking though that this is an inherently bad plant that should be eradicated from the country. Cattle are occasionally poisoned from this, but most animals will avoid these plants. And one of the interesting things about poisons is that very few of them are universal. A poison may affect one part of a typical mammal's body, but on the flip side, an insect might not have that body part and thus not be affected, and vice versa. For instance, the smell chemicals in a lot of our favorite herbs and spices are actually insect repellent for the plant. A lot of mints follow that pattern, for instance. So this poison works on mammals' central nervous system, but not on insects' nervous systems. So there's actually a number of insects that for them, this is an important source of food, or even their main food. You can see some things pollinating right now. Obviously, these plants need their flowers pollinated, and they have their nectar fairly exposed, so a lot of insects with shorter mouth parts have an easy time of it, including a number of bees and wasps. If you have problems with black swallowtail caterpillars eating your fennel or dill or whatever in your garden, this could be a great place to dump them, because they'll happily chow down on these leaves too. Some other moths and aphids will eat the leaves here too, or suck the juice out of the plant, a number of birds living around the water here will eat the seeds without batting an eye. So it does form an important part of the wetland ecosystem here. And interestingly, there have been a few practical applications for people as well. Some indigenous groups may have used this to make poison arrows. Now, I'm not certain on this. A lot of the references were to poison hemlock and not water hemlock. But then there were a bunch that were just ambiguous and said hemlock. And I did find one reference to the Klamath people of Oregon and California in there using water hemlock, but I don't know if that was just a mistake on the author's part or what. Poison hemlock makes a bit more sense to me, just because it is a much less violent of a poison. So if you happen to know more about that, I would be glad to hear about it down in the comments. On the medicinal side, there is some research that suggests that in very low controlled doses, this may have some anti-tumor and anti-leukemia activity, and may potentially be useful in fighting against breast cancer. But more research is definitely needed on this. Do not try that at home. One interesting exception I found to all this is that in China, apparently there is one variety of water hemlock that doesn't have the toxin, And apparently it's used as a spice and tastes kind of like cumin. Go figure. I am quite curious what the process looked like for going from this dangerous wild plant to that domesticated edible plant, but apparently that variety has shown some potential as an antifungal agent for preserving tomatoes. But please, again, do not try this at home. But before I wrap up, I should say this isn't all meant to scare you. All too often, foraging for the first time can be a very intimidating experience, and I've heard a lot of people express a pretty strong fear of accidentally ingesting a poisonous plant. And in a way, that's great, because it means you have a sense of self-preservation. But a poisonous plant isn't like a venomous snake that can sneak up and attack you from behind. I always advise Learn the main plants in your area to be cautious of. In my area, for instance, the carrot family and poison ivy are probably the biggest ones. But going with someone who really knows what they're doing can be a great way to get over that initial fear and uncertainty. And once you know where the boundaries are, it's a lot easier to explore freely. But that's all I have for this week. 
As always, if you have any corrections, suggestions, or disparaging remarks, feel free to comment that down below. And if you enjoyed this video, learned something, found it useful, and would like to see more, liking and subscribing always really helps me out. So for more weird and wonderful, tasty and toxic plants, join me next time on Ambling with Sam. <laughs>